All right. Welcome, everyone. Great to be with you on this Wednesday afternoon. I'm Amy McCreeth. I'm the president of Associated Parishes for Liturgy and Mission. And APLM is very, very glad to be offering this webinar this afternoon on this uh, really exciting movement to recover an expanded Advent. Thank you so much for being with us. Many of you who are here know a lot about the work of APLM. Uh, for those of you who don't, uh, the quick summary is that we are a group of uh, liturgical scholars and practitioners, lay leaders and clergy who gather to reflect on and uh, gain uh, more wisdom for liturgical formation and liturgical practice. And uh, we try to ferret out the frontiers of liturgy and its, in, its authentic enculturation uh, and are committed to uprooting the habits of Christendom so that the baptized are formed and freed to do the work that God has given them to do. So challenging our um, assumptions about what Advent is, is right up that alley. And uh, today we have uh, two people who are going to offer pr uh, a presentation uh, to help us to uh, begin this conversation and then two uh, terrific respondents. We're gonna hear from both of the presenters and then the respondents, um, and then we'll have some small group time. But let me just say a word about our presenters and respondents. Uh, we are gonna hear first from the very Reverend Bill Peterson, Dean Emeritus and Professor at Bexley Hall Seminary and the founder of the Advent Project Seminar. And he's the author, as many of you know, of What Are We Waiting For? Reimagining <laughs> Advent for a Time to Come. We'll then hear from the Reverend Dr. Elise Fireherm. She is the coordinator of the Anglican Episcopal Community of Learning at Boston University School of Theology, right down the road from where I am. And she is an adjunct professor there of Anglican Studies. She's also the Associate Rector at St. Paul's Church in Brookline. After those presentations, we'll hear responses, first from the Reverend Jennifer Zog, Rector of the Church of the Epiphany in East Providence, Rhode Island, and then from the Reverend Philip Carr Jones, Rector of Church of the Holy Spirit in Lebanon, uh, uh, New Jersey. Um, and speaking of Philip, I'm going to turn it over to Phil now, who uh, is the one who pulled this group together. So thank you to Phil, snaps for him. Um, and he has some folks who are recording this for us so that uh, we can post it and share it with other people. Phil's going to say a word about the format and what to expect, uh, and then we'll launch into uh, our our webinar. And uh, before I turn it over, just if you'd like to know more about APLM, uh, put your name and email address in the chat bar to me, and I'll follow up with you in the days ahead. So over to you, Phil. Terrific. Thank you, Amy. Great. Um, again, and a great joy to be with you all. Um, just a word about some of the advertisements. Um, my friend uh, Barbara Crafton emailed me privately and said, Phil, don't be Dan Quayle. There's no E in wreath. So apparently I wrote uh, an extra E at the end. It's just S only, no E. Uh, just as there is no, there's no Lent in Advent either. Um, so we're going to be gathering um, and for our keynoters for about 20 minutes or more. And then uh, Jennifer will respond. So around 140 or so, um, somewhere in there, I have you assigned in breakout rooms. Uh, and the questions are already posted in the chat. And then uh, each room will have a member of the uh, Associated Parishes Council in it to um, navigate the conversation a bit and move it along forward. Uh, we will be back no later than two o'clock, uh, maybe a short report out on what those conversations were like, uh, a word to the council members. And then um, some Q&A, open question and answers using chat, raise your hand, we're a small enough group or physically raising your hand or shouting it out to one of our um, respondents, at least has to leave earlier for BU. So uh, at that point, Bill, Jennifer, and I will be sort of um, fending, fielding the questions. And then we will end promptly, if not sooner, at 2.30 to go about our day. Um, you see my advent wreath, which I welded up earlier, lit already, seven, seven weeks. Um, 
it's our favorite season of the year here at Holy Spirit, but we'll get to that later. So um, let us move forward um, and I hand, hand it over to our keynote. Amy, Amy was very kind to mention uh, what are we waiting for? Reimagining Advent for a time to come, which is a book I published in 2017. Um, and there are, in unpacking that title, at least two puns, serious puns that were meant in that. Uh, and um, I would be referring to some of the material that I have um, published in that uh, book, but it had been, uh, it should be noted, I think, uh, in gestation for about 15 years before it was published. <clears throat> in 2005, uh, I founded the uh, Advent Project Seminar in the North American Academy of Liturgy, and uh, it has gone from there. And the two questions, uh, Elise Fireheim is going to uh, focus uh, this uh, afternoon, Eastern time, uh, on resources for an expanded Advent, but my job is to say something about the rationale, uh, what's behind this, what's foundational to it. And there are sort of two questions, I think, that uh, uh, come before us with that. First of all, the obvious, what is an expanded Advent? And um, so if we understand that, then the next question is, why would we observe it uh, in the church? Uh, the easy answer to what is an expanded Advent is it's a seven weeks, seven Sundays prior to Christmas, uh, a season uh, of its own. Uh, that's the expansion from the current, or what I like to call the truncated form of Advent, uh, now just four weeks long, uh, but the proposal is that it be seven weeks, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, the question of uh, why we would observe it uh, really goes back to being uh, a matter of understanding the liturgical reforms that uh, followed upon uh, and were affecting all the churches, in, in, especially in the Western world, uh, after Vatican Council II. There was a period of uh, liturgical renewal and reform that uh, came directly after the Council and was initiated. And one of those reforms uh, has to do with uh, answering the question, what is an expanded advent? Uh, and in order to understand what an expanded advent is, uh, one has to have reference to the lectionary. Uh, in the Western Church, there was an attempt after Vatican II and the ecumenical spirit of things to uh, produce a common lectionary for Christians of all traditions. Uh, that uh, partially succeeded and for a time uh, was in place. And then with some pullback, uh, as we may all remember, uh, there was a bit of a difference about uh, how that was to be manifested. And the Roman Catholic Church formed uh, its own lectionary, whereas the other churches that had been involved in that common lectionary project uh, moved on to uh, a common lectionary and then a revised common lectionary. And <clears throat> in that lectionary, if one looks at the readings for uh, the Sundays following All Saints Day in the church, uh, the seven Sundays that include the four Sundays that, are, that have been the Western church's tradition of Advent for a long time, uh, and the three Sundays before it, all have a common focus. And uh, that common focus uh, is in the, if, if one really examines the gist of the 63 possible lessons in the three-year cycle, A, B, and C, for those seven Sundays uh, of all the readings, the focus and thrust of that uh, is uh, eschatological. That is, it has to do with the full manifestation of the reign of God 
often that's talked about, uh, the parousia is often talked about as the second coming of Christ or the coming of Christ. Uh, I think it is better conceived as the full manifestation of the reign of God, kingdom of Christ, commonwealth of the Holy Spirit, uh, which terms I would consider to be all equivalent and interchangeable. Uh, and so that is the key to understanding an expanded advent, that there is this focus on eschatology, on the fulfillment of the reign of God uh, in those seven weeks. And it is only in the last week or so of advent that the focus begins slightly to shift towards incarnation. Now, over against that, of course, is uh, the fact that, uh, practically speaking, uh, we are dealing in our time and age ever since, uh, especially the turn of the 20th century, especially the time after World War II, of what uh, I have identified in my book and called, and uh, everybody understands to be a common thing, the Christmas culture. Uh, not only of the United States, but a Christmas culture that is general throughout the world. I have seen this Christmas culture in operation in Asia, in Africa, uh, as well as North America and other places uh, in my various travels. It is, it is a general thing. And it, uh, it tends to push Advent, uh, if Advent is understood at all, as a uh, time of only preparation for Christmas, that the essence of Advent is the uh, preparation of Christmas. Just today, for instance, uh, this very day, uh, church publishing uh, and the Episcopal Church's publishing uh, company uh, set out three books which it recommends for Advent, all of which have to do with the pilgrimage, as it were, to Bethlehem, rather than a focus that the lectionary has. Uh, I once made the mistake of asking a liturgics class I was teaching, if we really wanted to know what was the true essence of Advent, where would we look? And I was thinking, of course, they will come up with the idea that it must be the lectionary, because th those readings tell us what we're all about in terms of our observance of any given Sunday. Perhaps they'll say something about the colics, but, but I thought surely they will guess the lectionary. To a person, the instant response was uh, to my question of where would we look to find the real meaning of Advent, three or four members of the class blurted out without any hesitation, Google. <laughs> And I thought, I've got to rethink this question. <laughs> so I, it was like pulling teeth when I got around to it. And I finally said, OK, is it the lectionary? What is the lectionary telling us about this? And we got around to talking about eschatology uh, and uh, began to introduce the idea that Advent at the start of the liturgical year, if we focus on eschatology, makes the rest of the liturgical year different rather than just simply starting the same old round again each year. That is, we could enter it with uh, not just here we go again, but with deeper understandings about the reign of God, the kingdom of Christ, the commonwealth of the Holy Spirit, deeper understandings, higher expectations. It is a season of expectation, looking for the fulfillment of the reign of God, uh, as well as broader horizons. Uh, so deeper understandings, higher expectations, broader horizons uh, as the way to enter into it. This represents, of course, a change that took place with the very conception of Advent, uh, that followed upon Vatican Council II and affected all the Western churches. Uh, and that is um, that Advent ceased to be a penitential season. It had been for centuries, millennium, at least a millennium, if not a millennium and a half, 
a penitential season, a season which was uh, almost as rigorous in its observance as Lent uh, was. And uh, that raised cultural conflicts in my own life as I was growing up in uh, the latter half of the 20th century, uh, when uh, as in the, in the 50s, uh, as a high school student, junior high before that, I would be invited uh, to uh, Christmas parties during the early days of December and on towards Christmas. That's what the culture was doing. Whereas the church was telling me, at least in my family, which was observant uh, of the penitential season, uh, that this was a season of penitence and no parties, etc. And there was a real tension or conflict there. But that changed when the penitential aspect uh, was, uh, was downplayed uh, in favor of this eschatological emphasis. And uh, Adrian Nocent, N-O-C-E-N-T, a masterful three volume study uh, following Vatican uh, Council II of the liturgical year indicates uh, in his book uh, the first volume of his uh, cycle of the church year, that there was a, a debate, obviously, within the liturgical theological group that was working on the calendar. Uh, about And the debate had two sides. One was in favor of extending Advent so that it would be a longer season and not truncated as the four weeks are in the face, especially of contemporary culture. That was one side of the debate. The other side of the debate saying, well, the culture has moved. And so let's just make Advent a ramp up to Christmas. There seems to have been, it wasn't said baldly in Nosen's book and his scholarship, but it seems to me that there was a compromise reached that the truncated or four week Advent season would be retained in the Western church, but the focus of Advent would change to eschatological as not to simply a kind of ramp up to Christmas. That was the change that came and it has taken us the longer time uh, to ap appreciate it and to understand that uh, uh, we have an opportunity uh, in the church to observe a different essence that we can enter into the liturgical year, not just, as I, I'm repeating myself at this point, but not just as uh, starting the round again, but in the eschatological context, getting a deeper, higher and broader understanding and expectation with which to enter each liturgical year. And that means that Advent has an integrity of its own it has an essence that is its own and not simply as a ramp up to Christmas. Uh, so that's basically the idea, uh, the rationale for it. That is the expanded advent is those seven Sundays and the case for uh, um, an expanded advent really rests on understanding that the essence is about the reign of God the kingdom of Christ, the commonwealth of the Holy Spirit, and that the season is not just a preparation for another season. It has its own integrity and can in fact help us to enter into the other seasons of the church year uh, with uh, uh, greater uh, depth than ever before. That's the spiritual uh, promise, I think, of the observance of an expanded advent. So that's probably enough to start with uh, in terms of rationale. The question then becomes, you know, well, okay, you've got seven Sundays, how do you organize that? Uh, and one of the things that the Advent Project Seminar uh, thought of is that, you know, there in the monastic communities, uh, there are the, the days before Christmas from 17 to 24 December, there is an antiphon for the called the great O antiphons because of the extended singing of an O prior to the particular antiphon of the day that goes to the Magnificat at Evensong or Vespers uh, in the life of the community. We thought, why not take those 
antiphons, the great O antiphons, and make them uh, designations for the Sundays and seven Sundays of Advent. Uh, one of the things that that uh, that was recovered in the liturgical renewal uh, of the latter half of the 20th century was that every Sunday is a feast of Christ, and the great O antiphons are all about Christ. The messianic titles for Jesus as the Christ that come out of the Old Testament witness, uh, wisdom, Lord, uh, King of Nations, all the things that form, of course, that great Advent hymn, Bene Creators, uh, and I'm not Bene Creator, but uh, Bene Emmanuel, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, and uh, it's always amazing to me how many people don't know that that hymn is comprised of a compression of those antiphons into the, the verses of that hymn. So that's one of the things that uh, is a possibility for the designation of the Sundays in a progression. So in, in a way, it recaptures something old that is an ex a longer advent. It's something new because it takes the whole eschatological focus and renews it in the life of the church. Uh, it's not just the future of by and by, uh, but how is that to be manifested in the presence? And how is the expectation of the fulfillment to affect our own spirituality and our mission today? So that's probably enough, as I've said, for the beginning. Uh, maybe we can talk about resources. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, so you can see some things while I'm talking, pictures and other fun things. All right. Oops, and we've got to go back. So I'm going to address some of the practical matters of um, expanding our Advent to seven weeks. Um, and as Bill said, reflect a little on what are the what are the ways in which we can give this season some integrity and some cohesion. Um, so I'm going to talk about music. I'm going to talk about um, uh, setting your physical environment, talking about themes, um, all things which I think I hope uh, will be helpful to you. So I want to start with just an overview and reflection on the confluence of All Saints and Advent uh, every so often. Um, Advent one in a seven week Advent coincides with the celebration of All Saints Sunday, the Sunday following, um, following All Saints Day. So what to do about that? That happens this year. Um, the O antiphons, um, as Bill mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about hymnody and how hymnody can help us give the season some cohesion. Um, collects and intercessions, um, proper prefaces and Eucharistic prayers, and then a little bit about physical space. So um, just an overview here. So obviously, um, because Advent, a seven-week Advent, um, extends to early November, um, there are years in which Advent 1 and All Saints Sunday coincide. So what do you do when that happens? Um, so there's one solution, which is to celebrate All Saints Day on November 1st. I know it's a shock, um, but it could be done. Um, it is generally the practice, in, certainly in the Episcopal Church, to celebrate on the Sunday following um, but it is one of the major feasts of the church year, um, and certainly it deserves its own celebration, and that way you can start Advent uh, afresh the following Sunday. Another possibility, which we are doing at St. Paul's in Brookline this year, and we did last year as well, which is to celebrate All Saints on the last sun Sunday in October. Um, last year, it was October 31st. It was All Hallows' Eve, so it was perfect. Um, this year, this is October 30th. It's still close enough. Um, we're in that season of, um, of uh, All Hallows. Um, and so that's, that's my preferred solution, but 
it might work for your congregation, it might not. Another possibility which Bill Peterson has written about is to do a hybrid service in the tradition of Palm Passion Sunday. Begin with the All Saints celebration using, as Bill was mentioning before we got started, um, hymns that sort of make the connection between the communion of saints and the, the culmination of the, of the reign of God and then make the transition uh, into Advent at the liturgy of the table. And if you'd like to read a little bit more about that, there's um, the Advent Project website has a number of, a whole lot of resources there, but including this article uh, that Bill wrote on All Saints Sunday and Advent One. And we, you can talk more about that with those who have been practicing seven week Advent and see what they've, what they would say. Um, the O Antiphons, as Bill mentioned, are the basis for the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, traditionally sung uh, as antiphons for the Magnificat at Vespers in the monastic community. And each antiphon represents an image or a quality of the Messiah and the reign of God. And so these images, um, um, both musically and physically and, and visually, can provide a kind of cohesive focal point for each Sunday. And here are the antiphons, um, Sapientia, Wisdom, Adonai, our Lord, uh, Rex Gentium, the Ruler of Nations, the Root of Jesse, Key of David, Bright Morning Star, and God with us. You'll note that in the traditional order of the O antiphons, Rex Gentium um, is actually um, the next, I think it's the next to the last one, or the it's either the next to the last or the next to the next to the last. We have moved Rex Gentium up to the third week of Advent because it coincides with um, what we sometimes call Christ the King Sunday, um, which has been for us up until now the last, the last Sunday um, before Advent. And so the confluence there, I think, is helpful that it both resonates with what people are familiar with, um, but it fits within the larger context of the seven weeks of Advent. Um, sorry, I misspelled Emmanuel. I was going quickly when I did this. And just um, to think about um, how these might be used visually. Um, there are all sorts of resources out there, images of the O antiphons that would be wonderful to explore in your congregation. If you have artists, if you have material, um, uh, you know, fiber artists who weave or make banners, um, these images, I think, lend themselves to, um, to sort of marking and, and focusing our attention on, um, on what is happening. These come from... Um, these are called the rustic O antiphons um, and they're ornaments. And I actually had used them uh, at home in my own home practice. It also reminds us that Magnificat is the song of Advent, the song of Mary, casting down the mighty, lifting up the lowly, giving oneself to the coming reign of God with intent as, as Mary does. So um, what better way to, to sort of, um, celebrate Advent, but to actually um, sing that song, either as a song of praise, the basis of a Eucharistic prayer. There are lots of other song versions of the Magnificat out there. One of the most popular now is the Canticle of the Turning, which is the setting. Uh, it's set to the star of the county down, um, and it's a rousing song of, of the coming kingdom of God. Um, so I encourage you to to explore and find different ways. How can we sing the Magnificat um, during Advent um, every week? Um, I just wanted to also um, say a word about the Lenten or the Advent images of darkness and light. Um, and this, this, this relates to the whole question, I think of the Advent wreath in particular. Um, the, the season of Advent has been sort of filled with, at least in the Northern hemisphere, uh, with this, the expectation of the growing light, right? Our days are getting darker and we're looking forward to the, 
to the light that comes into the world. And this traditional collect for the first Sunday in the four week Advent, we all know very well, almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Um, now in the time of this mortal life in which your son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility. This collect um, is, is powerful in its um, um, eliciting the, the second coming, but it does assume that uh, darkness is something we want to avoid. Um, and in a culture, um, in a society in which darkness of skin um, is equated with um, evil uh, and criminality um, and, the, and the, the ancient sin of, um, of racism in this country makes, makes us, I think, um, rightly um, cautious about reinforcing that. So I just want to offer um, a suggestion. And this is a collect that I pray every day in Advent. Um, at the end of morning prayer. Um, so, and it's encouraged actually in the prayer book that one would pray this prayer every day. So what happens if you're praying this prayer every day? I wanna share an alternative. Um, well, and just ask, ask us to think about how does our use of imagery and darkness and light resonate in a society in which racism is so deeply embedded? And are there other metaphors, images that might serve us better? or at least as a counterbalance to the traditional darkness light image? And what are the implications for designing our physical space and our liturgy? That is, are there alternatives to candles and wreaths? And I just want to uh, uh, call your attention to an adaptation of this prayer um, written by um, a colleague of Amy's and mine, um, the Reverend Pam Wurntz. Um, she just changed the first sentence or the first phrase, and it's beautiful. Uh, Almighty God, to whom darkness and light are both alike, give us grace to cast away the bonds of sin and to stand up for your justice and love. And then it continues uh, in the way of the traditional collect. So I just want us to, to, to bear in mind as we're thinking about practical matters, um, what are the consequences of using this imagery? In terms of hymnody, setting the tone early, which is easy when you're following the lectionary, um, the story of the wise and the foolish bridesmaids comes pre-Advent. It's a classic Advent um, gospel, and it is um, it is a story. Um, it is a story that has hymns that go with it. So, um, you know, if you just read the lectionary, you will be singing Advent hymns very easily. Hymns that emphasize the reign of God, using the Magnificat. Um, and there are Advent hymns that we don't pay much attention to or that aren't listed as Advent hymns. Um, one of Bill's and my favorites is O Day of God, which we have in the uh, to a much better tune in the hymnal 1940. That's why that is listed there. Um, Joy to the World, which is actually, if you look at it, is an Advent hymn. It is about the coming reign of God. It's not about a baby. Um, in uh, the Episcopal Church's Wonder, Love, and Praise, signs of endings all around us, hymns that call our attention to the transformation of the world uh, by God, and then resources from places like Iona and Tize um, will give us a lot more to work with um, if we're focusing Advent in this way. And here, just by the way, is Joy to the World to a different tune to the tune Richmond, uh, which is from the hymnal 1940. And I would encourage you to think about what would it be like to sing this hymn to a different tune in Advent and then change the tune at Christmas? What would that mean? Or how could you be preaching on um, a hymn like this? And then this is O Day of God to the tune that Bill and I like. We don't just like it. It's a tune that is um, expresses the longing and that kind of modal tension that I think Advent requires. For collects, uh, Bill has written a set of seven collects that all revolve around the, um, the themes of the O antiphons. And you can find them there at the adventproject.org. Those can be used either as a collect for the day 
Or if your congregation is not ready for that, you can use it as a conclusion to the intercessions. So I think the you can you can adapt and alter your liturgy um, as much or as little as you feel like you can at this point in your in your journey toward a, a longer advent. Intercessions. We also have a set of intercessions uh, on the Advent Project page, which again follow the the designations of the O antiphons. But the Anglican Church of Canada has a lovely litany for Advent in the Book of Alternative Services, which also follows the O antiphons. I can see those being used as prayers, as intercessions, um, or as a song of praise, um, or write your own, right? But um, use the intercessions to emphasize and to build on these themes. We also have proper prefaces and Eucharistic prayers um, on the website, um, which, uh, well, actually we have proper prefaces. We don't have Eucharistic prayers up there yet, um, but proper prefaces, which again, focus on the kingdom of the reign of God. Um, and two, one for early in the season, the one towards the end, which is a parallel to our Lenten practice. And if you're looking, if you're able to use alternative Eucharistic prayers, I commend to you, um, there's a prayer in evangelical Lutheran worship, which is meant for Advent through Epiphany, which I think is interesting, um, but I think it works very well for Advent um, in terms of its themes. Gail Ramshaw has also written a wonderful um, uh, uh, Advent Eucharistic prayer. Physical space. Well, what about the Advent wreath? People are going to ask that. And are there alternatives? Um, and I want us to think about that. But whatever you do, um, what we're trying to do is building a sense of expectation, um, not of a baby, but of the transformation of the world. So I just wanted to end with some pictures. Um, in response to the what about the Advent wreath, this is the, our Advent wreath at St. Paul's in Brookline. And our altar guild didn't blink an eye. Um, they um, simply put a piece of ple plexiglass on top of the, the, um, the wreath. Uh, we were lucky to have a flat one and ordered tall um, dark blue candles um, and set about doing it. There are the ribbons, um, each week they add more ribbons and then I don't know halfway through the season they start to add greens and so by the end of the season it is full of greens and full of ribbons so there's a sense of fullness beyond just light um, here's the um, the advent wreath that Phil um, told you about um, at Holy Spirit in Lebanon New Jersey um, I love that this is it, it breaks the mold of the traditional wreath and circle, um, but it just reminds us there are a lot of different ways to do this. This is one from, uh, this is in a Canadian cathedral um, with, these are actually blocks, wooden blocks with tea lights, I think um, put uh, in the top so that you're not gonna have the um, problem with one candle burning down too much. Um, these are pictures from Jennifer's Church in Rhode Island. So they've used tapers. It's a little hard. It's a little hard to see. It's a little dark, um, but I love the dark blue also that they're using, which is it's the color of the sky just before dawn. It's that dark blue that's really the Advent color of expectation. Um, but it doesn't have to be candles. So here's a church that had a banner for each of the O antiphons. I can imagine adding one every week until the end of the season. And you have this beautiful um, kind of panorama. Um, here's another set of O antiphon of their banners for, um, for Advent in which as you add them, right, they continue the picture or continue the kind of the panorama as you go along. And so again, you have this sense of building um, expectation. This is what I have at home. It doesn't have to be a wreath. I found this at Pier 1, this uh, candelabra. And I, as you can see, the ornament for wisdom is there. And I add an ornament every, um, every week. Here are some other um, seven-week uh, Advent wreaths. The one on the left belongs to Bill 
Peterson and his wife, Priscilla. On the right are some reads that we did at St. Paul's with members of our congregation. Um, and here are some others that, um, that Phil sent along. So there's lots of ways, um, lots of ways to do it. All right, I am going to stop sharing. So that is just so much more to say. <laughs> Thank you. Well, oh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Bill and Lisa. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to, I want to jump in with, I have so many things. I want to, <laughs> after our experience of doing it for, for a long time, but Jennifer, why don't you start with your response to this? There was a question in the chat I want to address quickly, um, which was uh, with some of these adaptations and expansions, do we need the bishop's permission to do so? I have had no problem with our bishop. I did tell him what we were doing. Um, so I don't know, I guess that all depends on who's your ordinary, but uh, I can't imagine anyone having a problem with that. Our own bishop said, Philip, you're the only one doing it in, your, in our diocese. But every time I'm at a confirmation at the end of November, I'm thinking about what you're doing because those readings are all about Advent. So he's on board. I, I, I would just say um, you probably should reach out to your ordinary and explain what you're doing. I think they all know what, what this is, but up to you. Well, Jennifer, I'll hand it over to you. And how do you handle it with your vision? Sure, sure. I was just going to um, follow on with that and say I did the same with my bishop. Um, and in the spirit, you know, in the Episcopal Church, in the spirit of prayer book expansion and expanding liturgies, um, he was very encouraging of let me know how it goes. I'm really interested in this. Um, you know, and we're really not doing anything outside of what we would do anyways in in the most basic ways. We're following the lectionary like everyone else is. We're we're changing some of the things around it. We're emphasizing different themes. So I I really don't think any bishops would would have an issue with it. But always good to say something. Um, just wanted to share a little bit before Phil jumps in. His parish has done this for a long time. Um, I have been at my current parish in East Providence for seven years seven Advent cycles. We're gonna enter our eighth Advent cycle together um, in a few months. And I introduced this a couple of years after I came. So I had the experience of introducing an expanded Advent to a parish that had never heard of it. So I just wanted to share a little bit about what that was like in response to what um, Bill and Elise had said. And, and they were both um, my inspirations for doing this. And when they talked to me about the expanded Advent, it, I just said, yes, of course, of course. It, it was sort of a discovery of, what's always been there. Um, so I guess I wanted to say as a, as a parish minister, uh, you know, how do you, how do you introduce this to people without getting a, a lot of the, well, how, how do we do the Advent wreath? And well, what happens to this? And what, you know, a lot of those anxious questions. Um, so I guess I, I would say three things, anticipate the practical ahead of time. Um, if you take Elise's slides and present them, I think that's a lot of anticipating the practical. Uh, how do we do the advent wreaths? What are the altar hangings going to look like? Um, but I, I would say what I did also was I pointed out the logical. Um, I did not dive in with the theological reasons at the outset. Um, I kind of went for the obvious and the practical. And I said, hey, folks, November is always a weird season. Um, it's this sort of coda to the end of the what feels like the end of the liturgical year. We have such a great All Saints Day celebration. And I would say that's one of the things that really helped um, sort of sell the expanded Advent, if you will, is really focus on All Saints, make it a big deal, make it special, um, special hymns, anthems from the choir, um, lots of color, lots of remembrances of, of beloved ones, um, the saints in heaven, do a lot with All Saints Day, make it the full liturgical celebration and the full feast that it is. Um, because it's a natural culmination of the liturgical year. Uh, and that's what I really emphasize with people. I kind of said, like, let's look at the practical folks. The three weeks of November are sort of weird. And what is Christ the King anyway? It's a 1960s invention. Um, what, what are we doing? And um, saying, you know, we always feel rushed in Advent. We don't ever get to enjoy the Advent. And, and what Bill said about the competition of the Christmas culture you know, resonated with me and my experience of a four-week Advent. Um, I just feel in such competition and so rushed with it. Uh, and I said, hey, this gives us time to really be an Advent. Um, 
and these themes work together. So I really emphasized with them just how practical and how sort of obvious it is if we look at the lectionary we already have and hey this fits the puzzle pieces together much better than this chopped up you know sort of three weeks of November Christ the King and then a rushed four-week advent. Um, so I'd say anticipate the practical ahead of time. Um, it was helpful for us to kind of point out the logical uh, and then teach the theology. We did some adult forums, we did some newsletter articles, uh, just any, any way you can get it. Worked it in sermons, um, however you communicate best with your parish. Um, talked with the vestry, talked with the formation committee. Um, honestly, thought of um, ways to introduce it to children and youth as well. You know, the church school teachers come to you, well, what are we supposed to do? We have, we have our four-week curriculum. Um, give, them, give them opportunity to participate. Uh, maybe the kids help make some of those banners. Maybe the kids do some work on, the, um, on a Jesse tree or some of the other O antiphon symbols. Um, and I would say, as I said, emphasizing All Saints Day really helped us to feel like we've culminated the liturgical year um, with the saints in heaven and on earth and to come. Baptisms on All Saints Day were especially helpful for that. Uh, and then we could really um, devote ourselves to, to a full expanded Advent. Um, what, uh, what Elise was pointing out in terms of the resources, so helpful. Uh, we use the proper prefaces, uh, the two for the, the two parts of the season. Um, we used O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Um, and we did one verse a week um, as the presentation hymn. So whatever verse corresponded to um, that O Antiphon of the week, that was our presentation verse. Um, and we sung that before the Eucharist uh, every week. So that kind of got it into people's heads and, and that sense of anticipation. Um, what else would I say? Um, I just, I think for us, um, we introduced it ahead of time. You know, I spent October uh, kind of preparing people, um, saying, this is what we're gonna do. This is an exciting new thing. I always think the tenor with which you introduce something kind of um, has a lot to do with the outcome. So um, we were excited well, about it. This is interesting. We're gonna try it for a season and then we'll evaluate. And so the evaluation on the back end was important. Um, when we got past Epiphany, you know, and not in the Christmas season, not right away, but once we got um, past Epiphany Sunday, you know, I came back to folks um, in an adult forum, in um, newsletter surveys. What did you think? What was your experience of this? Um, and the feedback I got um, was either, oh, that was interesting. That's, you know, okay, um, we'll do that again. But I also got a lot of, we have more space it felt more spacious. Um, it didn't feel rushed. We could um, enjoy Advent more. I got a lot of that. Uh, so that, that said to me that this is, this is getting into people's hearts and spirits. Um, they have found this helpful. And it was a way, some of them said, to focus on the, the spiritual meaning of Advent before they were subsumed into the Christmas culture that is so hard to fight. Um, and the busyness of December. So that felt important. Um, and that said to me, an expanded Advent is doing what we hoped it would do, to be the this, this season to anticipate the, the spiritual heart of expecting the reign of God um, and seeing the reign of God here. I do find um, the expanded Advent focus on, on the fulfillment of the reign of Christ to be helpful language. Um, I find kingdom language can be tricky with people. Um, so that, that I found helpful in explaining and, and teaching theologically. Um, the light and dark too, it, it's just an ongoing thing we have to wrestle with uh, imagery. And I found for us, I actually offered more evening services in Advent. Um, so for an expanded Advent, I would offer Saturday evening services where you could really get into the imagery of candle lighting um, and, and work with the darkness of the season and the early, here on the far East Coast, it gets early, it gets dark at like 3.30 in December. Um, so we kind of worked with that and that seemed to be helpful to people. Advent is, is a season to kind of sit in the quietness 
and learn the gifts. And we talked a lot about the gifts of darkness. Um, Barbara Brown Taylor was good at that in her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark. Um, so those are just my responses and my experience with it. We've had a very positive experience. Um, when it came back around to the next um, late summer and fall, people said, are, are we going to do that again? Are we going to do the longer advent? Um, so we have, and we've continued in the tradition. Um, and we will continue. So if, if you have questions about how, you know, how to introduce it, I'd be happy to speak more to that. But um, huge fan uh, of the spiritual and pastoral um, sides of an expanded advent. So Phil. Yeah. What else, okay. What well, else can you we've, been, we've been at this for um, uh, many years, maybe even predating the book, uh, Bill. But that was a great resource to um, give me a little imprimatur, a little more um, pedigree to it um, for authenticity. So I was um, drawn to a couple of points uh, in the presentations. I'll, I'll deal with the darkness. We've been using the term shadow from Tolkien as a way of around the language of darkness. So uh, it's still the same concept, but shadow at least has a little more nuance, but I'm really looking forward to this collect about you know light and dark are you both the same. It's biblical and fabulous. Um, the Eucharistic prayer itself for us in these last days, right? We say that phrase in prayer, be uh, until Christ comes again in all of them, um, that there already is the language of eschatology. And so the folks here embraced it fairly quickly because they were immersed in it because it's part of our Eucharistic tradition. Uh, I had no pushback whatsoever. Um, I believe I was a little bit cowardly in the first moment and I used expanded Advent A, expanded Advent B, expanded Advent C, and then when traditional Advent one, two, three, and four, we still use the seven old um, um, antiphons. Um, uh, uh, of note, Amy, have other antiphons that you use at the cathedral, right? That your musician has put together and maybe we can get that posted up, that resource, because I think that deals with some of the male language as well, the expansive language. Uh, it's been really healthy for us because um, uh, we can now have an eschatology we don't have to apologize for. And the eschatology is not owned by the biblical fundamentalists who have distorted it beyond all biblical proportion. So we have this much healthier sense of the inbreaking realm of God. And so for lastly, it is just such a season of hope. And um, it's such a positive, energizing thing in our community. So we're drawn to it. The folks are energized. They're inviting people to come to this because it's got a whole nother sense about itself. Um, and it's, uh, it really builds up a healthy energy in the community to which is sort of infectious. So in terms of a church growth sort of strategy, having an expanded advent is just, you know, it's not just new and improved and look at this, it's a new thing for new things sake. It has that ancient sense of it. Um, and in terms of um, the fulfillment of God, the perfecting grace of God, it's just wonderful to sort of uh, drench in it a little bit longer. Um, it just is so spiritually uh, helpful for us here, and it's been a, a wonderful thing. We actually have a threefold sense of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany as a almost an inclusio, um, um, all saints to Son of the Transfiguration, uh, and it just builds up uh, beautifully for us. With we do every person house blessing, we go around to bless every single house in the season of Epiphany, and it's sort of mirrored by anticipated by this um, season of Advent for us. Um, energy, healthy, and hope. Um, so I just think it's the, just a fabulous season of hope. And for those of us who have struggled with seasonal affective disorder, having light uh, and hope is uh, exactly what we need. So um, that's been our experience here. Um, oh, thank you, Amy. It's posted up. Uh, the antiphon in the source is right there. Uh, so we want to do that. Now we have a couple of questions. If you go to the beginning of chat, we'll just spend, we're already at almost two o'clock and I want to leave time for Q&A. So let's, um, I'm going to break for just 10 minutes. And if you scroll up to the questions, how does the Christmas culture subvert Advent in your community? What does the realm of God on earth as it is in heaven, which we pray at every Lord's Prayer, mean to you in the context of Advent? Or how does that expressed in your community life? Um, how do you preach that? 
And then how would you explore the inbreaking realm of God in your context? If you had more time, what are the opportunities for spiritual growth? Um, oh, we have a couple more messages. Let me take a quick look. Okay, great. Uh, we need to get that doc in public access. So we'll work on that. All right, we'll break up and let's just spend like 10 minutes and come back at, um, in 10 minutes and just have a little brief conversation, introduce yourselves to each other and off we go. Hi, Dot. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Other people have been listening, but aren't looking in. John Rollins. He's from uh, Church of the Holy Spirit. He's with me. And Phil. Uh, what town? Lebanon, New Jersey. Oh, okay. All right. We have a Holy Spirit, Orleans on Cape Cod. Oh. Uh, so not that one. So are you seriously thinking you guys are going to do this? Oh, we've been doing it for a number of years. Uh, and what would you say are the benefits? It's it, it's as been as has been stated. It's um, it. I find it to be an easier um, time leading up to to kind of slows things down. Yeah, yeah. And it, I find it gives me more of a focus on on the church and the reign of God. Uh, because I'm not all caught up in that Christmas crap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you're not doing this yet? I have no idea. I just had never heard of it. And I thought I'll find out what, you know, what it is. And I have a, a, a thing where I tell the kids, you know, there's four weeks getting ready for Christmas and then there's 12 days of Christmas and then we have you know epiphany five weeks getting ready for holy week oh. and then there's 50 days of Easter and so you know it wouldn't make sense to me to have more time getting ready for Christmas season than we have for Easter Easter's the bigger feast yeah but you, you uh, I find you take the focus off of Christmas and more focus on what Advent is and not so much leading up. Right. To it's the prophetic vision of the parousia. I get that part. Yeah. Oops. I don't know how to say no to that. Silence. There we go. <laughs> so, so you're John, going to try it? I, you know, I'm... I'm not quite on my feet here this fall. I, I think it's been, we've been doing a lot of catch up since COVID and um, um, I've had to hire a new secretary who I'm still teaching. And I'm, I hired a Sunday school person last week who starts in four days oh my and I'm, I'm just drowning. So if, you know, if my life were even keeled, plus we have a lawsuit against us from our backyard neighbors who don't want us using our hall for parties. Oh, so, yeah, my, 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 my brain and soul are not in whatever uh, balance right now. Yeah. Well, do a little bit more research, look at the yeah. project by. by sure. Them. Yeah. And it's very different than um, we did an O Antiphon's service instead of a lessons and carols one year. Oh, and, you know, people felt like that was just adding on way too much, but we got the nice banners and 
Um, I think if they felt like it was slowing things down, that that would be more appealing than adding one more thing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. Well, you have to get and try it, you know. Yeah, you right. See what the feedback is. Yeah, maybe next year. So it's good yeah. to know about, but I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it off in the next few weeks. Uh, I don't well, even have, have a whole year to think about it. Yeah, <laughs> right. A whole year about it. <laughs> and that's about the pace people need around here. It's yeah, yeah. It's a slow moving church. We're on Cape Cod. I probably said that already. Yeah, that's a beautiful place. Uh, it is, I guess. A lot of people <laughs> come here for vacation, but yeah. It's one it's of great. my sister's favorite places to go on vacation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Has she taken you with her? No, no. She has a husband that she drags along. <laughs> wow. Yeah. My husband's not very draggable. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you go on vacation? Living in Cape Cod. I know. I haven't really had a vacation. You'd laugh, but when our family all came for a family reunion we just rented a place 20 minutes away so well, that I guess you'd sense. say we we go on vacation here too <laughs> wow yeah sometimes those home vacations are even better than going away yeah oh yeah well and it was great because if we forgot something we just drove home and got it <laughs> yeah wow that's a good good yeah. thought uh -huh. So at your church, what roles do you play? I'm a deacon. Okay. I'm Phil's deacon. All right. Well, I have a fabulous deacon as well. Oh, well, so does he. And do you help um, shape different uh, ministries or you just uh, focus Actually, mostly on Sunday mornings? How do you pitch in? You well, when, when I came on board, the deacon who was here before me, had set up all of the ministries with mm. a lay person leading them. So it didn't leave very much for me to do. But at the time we, we had what we called the shawl ministry where we would go to the women's prison. There's only one women's prison in New Jersey. And we would go there twice a week and we would either knit or crochet we would pray with the ladies. We would talk to them. Um, it was a ministry that I loved. And then when COVID hit, they wouldn't let us in anymore. So that kind of went by the wayside. Yeah. Um, and and I, I, all services on Sunday and any special occasion, I love doing that. I love being in church and serving at the altar. It's, it, it just brings me a peace. And, yeah. Uh, uh, and anything that comes up, we have dinners and, and uh, I don't, the only thing I'm not really involved in is um, formation. We have a wonderful lady who's dealing with the children's formation and she just does huh. a fabulous job. Huh. So, um, I, but I, I attend the staff meetings and I, I kick in where I can. Um, and uh, I do, I take a service into a local nursing home about every five to six weeks, I take it in. And um, that's, that's, oh, plenty. I just, yeah, that's plenty. I do home visits. That's uh, essential. Yeah, that's been hard to get rolling again since COVID. Yes, yeah. But I have one elderly couple that about once a month, she sends me an email and says, please bring us communion. And I go over and it's like a visit. It's not just a go in, give them communion and leave. We have a nice, it's at least a half hour, 45 minutes. Yeah. And they're a lovely couple and I love visiting them. So it's, a, you get to know people. Yeah, that's good. Good church folks. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I do hospital visits when it's when we have somebody in the hospital. So I keep myself busy, although oh. I do miss the prison. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, It'll come back. Yeah. Well, I'm not so sure. There for years these been the governors have been talking about closing that. And oh. the, and what they would do would send the women like to the 
county jails, which yes. they're not good at all. So mm -hmm. I don't know what they're going to do. They've been um, letting early people go early, um, cutting short their sentences because of COVID. And, and then there have been some incidences of abuse, sexual and otherwise. Sure. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. yeah, there's been bad stuff in the news. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's safe anywhere. No, that's for sure. That's for sure. Hmm. How big is your parish? Uh, how do you want to measure it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, how many families? So we have 112 pledging units. Oh, that's not bad. That's households. Um, and I would say that there are, you know, five households that actually have children who are under the age of 14. Wow. Um, yeah. So, you know, what they say about Cape Cod is true. It, it's Florida of the North. I think our average age on Sunday morning is about 76. Yeah. We have an elderly population too. Yeah. Uh, not, not too many young families. So that's right. what we're trying to attract. Yeah. Well, yeah. You have to go to them. I think you got to can't attract people. Trying. You got to just yeah. show up on the doorstep and who knows, scare them away. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We tried to do, you know, church in a bag on COVID yes. days. Yeah. Uh -huh. Whatever. Uh -huh. can't, can't judge ourselves. I, I think we're only meant to be the salt. We're not the host, whole stew. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have people who still won't come back to church. Yeah. So. They're still blaming it on COVID. Are you doing uh, masks in church? So the altar party, I require to wear masks. Everybody else is optional. The choir is way behind the altar, so they don't have to wear a mask either. But, uh, you know, I, if I'm giving somebody bread and I cough or something, I don't want that to go on them. Uh, yeah, that's that. It's a little hard, but we also were online every service so people can watch from the comfort of their living room. I think you froze up. All right. Um, I was going to say, um, 
Stephen, I, I don't. I thought we we found the Christ the King Sunday in the context of Advent to be quite lovely, so it fit quite in. So we didn't have any sort of. We were able to have a festival of Christ the King, though we were in blue vestments, but we were the lectionary and the readings um, all worked beautifully. So I didn't find it to be. Now I'm not. We're not. You know, Church of Christ the King. So that that would be one thing in what you're suggesting in terms of that. But I. We found it just by celebrating a Rex Genentium as or Gentium as that's done worked just quite fine for us. So I, we were able to have that little feast um, within a feast without really much. Uh, uh, it just seemed to go fairly well. All right, let's go back to any Q and A. So we're just a few of us now, and so if you want to ask a question, just shout it out. And we'll, we'll plan and, and uh, Bill's still here and Jennifer and I are still here. At least had to go, as did Amy. Any response or question or how did your small group, if there was a point or a, a thought that came up that was uh, salient, why don't you share that with our larger group? Jay Coyle is usually good for something to say. I just wanted to see if anybody else remembered anything brilliant that I did say, Phil. Okay. We had a really good discussion in our group, actually, about uh, touching on a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, um, you know, we sort of had a, a progression of thought, and uh, uh, it's interesting how we all seem to cue into what other people were saying. One of the things that um, I think it was, it was either Christian or John that said about how often when our planning we start at Christmas and work our way back and how this invites us to start with where we see ourselves going in terms of hope. Was that Christian or John or both of you that sort of contributed to that anyway? Um, because it seems to me in, in that, that the, the arcs of, of our season, in this season, uh, a lot of times people with the four week Advent see the fourth Sunday of Advent, even if they get the first three or have this eschatological tone, that on the fourth Sunday we're now turning to, to Bethlehem. Um, as opposed to the whole season has prophetic voices, including the fourth Sunday, pointing to the hope that's before us and the revelation uh, of, 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 of uh, the kingdom and Jesus bearing the reign of God and, and embodying it. Um, and how uh, I sort of look at the, 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 the climax is, is the baptism of the Lord. Uh, even and, and John also pointed out that I found really helpful is, I mean, and I think we all agree, we don't want to necessarily tone down the celebration of Christmas, but we sort of treat Christmas as if the whole world rejoices at the birth of this baby, and John can speak to this better, and maybe you should speak to that, John, what you shared with our group, but that's actually not <laughs> what we see in the story. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say something about that, John, and what how that might impact on even how we approach the, all of this, but... You're, you're muted, John. You have to unmute. Yes, we dress up Christmas as if the whole world was was, was always celebrating the, the birth of the Messiah. But the, the, the canonical story is uh, uh, he was a humble peasant and uh, they knew nothing about it, his birth. And, and this... This is the shock to come uh, at the end of the Advent season when we've been thinking about the, the triumph of Christ to remember that it began in such a humble way. Mm. Mm. Yes, and if you look at the Matthew version, it's not the whole world rejoicing with the birth. Herod had a different take on it altogether. Hmm. Well, gosh, this sounds a lot more prosaic than uh, than all of that. But Mary and I had a good conversation about church expectations around the seasons of Advent and Christmas. And we've always done it this way and we've never done it that way. I have a pretty flexible loving kind congregation but but mary and i both agreed that the choir and the altar guild would have a few things to say about bumping advent 
into a longer season. The other thing about that is my, my, our parish has a lot of families. And so I, I told Mary, I preach every year on sinking into Advent and we're not at Christmas yet. And we have to be in Advent and it is a penitential blah, blah, blah. And I was, yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I've got, I can't stay for coffee or I got to go Christmas shopping. I'm like, but, 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 and, and, and finally, our big, our biggest fundraiser of the year for the church is the December Christmas Gala, which is the first weekend of December. And I can change a lot around All Saints. I can't change that. <laughs> I, I would be booted out into, into the Advent chill if I tried to pull some stuff like that. There are ways in which I would like to integrate a more mindful and longer Advent season. One of the things that Mary suggested and, and that we kind of landed on is preaching on that way and teaching on that before the season of Advent to prepare people for a fuller mm -hmm. season. And it may be that in God willing, I'm here for years to come, we start working into what would it look like to have an extended Advent. But the other thing about that is I need to know more about it because this is the first I've ever heard of expanded Advent. So before I try and hand it off to my liturgists and choir and altar guild and, and parishioners, I need to know more um, so that so that I can convey the meaning a lot better than I think I'd be able to do right now. I love hearing about it, though. Thank you. Bill, Bill's book is really, it's a slim thing, so, and it's still for sale, right, Bill? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, not I, getting, I would... I'm not getting rich on royalties, uh, but uh, uh, one thing I want to say about that, Susanna, uh, uh, one of the things we found is the church musicians uh, are often welcoming of an expanded advent because it gives them and their choirs uh, more opportunity to to cover the advent repertoire, which otherwise gets short changed. So that's something to think about. Mm. Yeah, I I just don't I don't know. What we we still I, I we have uh, a professional Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus in our parish. It is their major source of income for six months of the year. Um, and they always do a breakfast, well, we always do a breakfast with St. Nicholas. Um, and that's sometime around his feast day, which is sometimes in, isn't that early December or something like that? Yeah, December 6th. Yep, yeah, so that's fine. And we have him as a bishop attire. I made a little mitre for him and, and we do the whole uh, Bishop of Myra uh, of Turkey thing. Um, and it's it's delightful. So I angle can and we'll do both and on these things and have a blend. So we're not like rigid about no Christmas, no, you know, and so people were able to do all have that, but with the seven weeks, you still have this overarching theme that flows through. That's been our experience. So we haven't really sort of tam tried to tamp down Christmas. We just let Advent flow and it was quite quite comfortable. Um, of course, I could be in denial and my parishioners would yell at me, but I think it's, I think I'm accurate. Um, just having, a, having both having, we did, we used to have a give when I first came here, it's been years, they used to have a giving tree as a, and people would bring presents for the local folks. So we just turned it into a Jesse branch and have this massive branch hanging with chrismons all over it. And you take a tag off for the local halfway house for somebody and so on. So that, with that, but there was a one thing we did do was get rid of a, a fake Christmas tree and had a real branch of an evergreen in the in the in the north there. That sort of and it didn't dry out and make a mess. Oddly, no. It, you know, for uh, yeah, we might not have popped that up until December, so we got about four weeks out of it. I don't know that we started in in Advent, so you get four weeks out of a big branch, and we're talking about six eight foot long, so it's, it's not going to dry out too much. And yes, by the time you take it down, it makes a mess, but that's what a vacuum is for. Maybe. I don't know. Jennifer, how about you? Did you bump into any of that? Yeah, I was going to say um, one year, the first year we did it, the, you saw the picture maybe of all the greens on the wreath because the altar guild really liked to put greens. There's a big tradition of greens. So we started out with all the greens on the wreath and it, you know, they were crispy by week five. Um, so we actually had to, we replaced them and we did a second, you know, round of greens. Um, so there were ways around it. I, we've learned since then, um, as Phil was saying, we've, we sort of create a little progression to the season. 
So the greens don't tend to come in now until the fourth and fifth, maybe even fifth and sixth week of the season. Um, and you, you got the progression with some of the banners. So yeah, I, I hear that. Um, and vacuum cleaners helped with the rest, but yeah, there, there's a little bit of just adaptation. <coughs> Any, any question for Bill the person about this as well on a theological or um, liturgical history kind of thing? So I, would, I, I did I hear you earlier though, Bill, is Advent actually the seven the lengthier Advent, does it predate the four week? I'm sorry, what? The... Does, does your, does the expanded Advent actually historically predate the shorter version of Advent or? Quite a bit. I mean, there was okay. a practice East and West in, in, the, in the early church world uh, by the fourth century. Uh, when Advent really becomes comes into its own, there was uh, a longer season, and it was the church, not the Roman Catholic Church, but the church in Rome that was basically responsible for truncating it to four weeks. And mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the the compromise there was that it was penitential, like it had been in Northern Europe. Uh, I don't know what it is about penitence in Northern Europe, but that's <laughs> the way it is. And uh, it took a long time for a four week advent to catch on in the West. And it was only uh, only in the Tridentine Reformation, that is the counter reformation to use the pejorative term, that, that, uh, that Rome was able to standardize it. But there were some churches that could uh, prove that their liturgy was more ancient. So in the Archdiocese of, the, of Milan and the Archdiocese around Barcelona and some in Eastern Spain, uh, continued to use an, a, a longer advent, even <laughs> in the face of the standardization that took place in the 16th century. Good. It's a tangled, uh, it's a tangled story. Yeah, uh, Maria. I, um, I'm just curious if you could speak a little bit to, um, at least in Eastern Christianity, the, the season before Christmas is a Lenten season um, or a fasting season. Um, and so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how Advent is not Lent um, in the Anglican tradition and just unpack that a little bit. Sort of where, uh, it, that, it, how did that shift? Did it shift? Which, and then why? It, it, it always was. Uh, it, it was in terms of what the Anglican tradition inherited from the Western church. It was a, it was a penitential season, hence the color purple. Uh, and uh, that began to change uh, after Vatican II when the liturgical reform of the Roman Catholic Church began to affect other traditions. Uh, and, and that it became uh, uh, part of part of the teaching of Anglican liturgical theologians uh, in the seminaries that, that Advent uh, was not to be considered any more penitential season uh, in the sense of being a little Lent uh, kind of thing. And there, by the way, there are other reasons for what is the penitential aspect of Advent. Uh, and since it's about the kingdom, it's corporate penitence rather than individual penitence. I've just published an article uh, in the North American Academy of Liturgy's uh, proceedings, which addresses uh, the corporate nature of penitence during Advent. Uh, that can be found online, by the way, through the North American Academy of Liturgy. Uh, and it's a good question because it, it isn't an exiling of penitence altogether. It's a recasting of it. Are you in Portland? That's why it says PDX. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we have lots of family in Oregon and Washington. So even though we live in New York. <laughs> it's a nice place to be. Yeah. When it's too hot. When it's not we're so in hot. New York. Are you in Manhattan or someplace else? Uh, Rochester. Oh, could be California. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, my, I've always right. said that culturally speaking, the Midwest starts in 10 miles from each coast. Okay, I want to be respectful of our time. We have a few more minutes left. Um, but I'm going to. Um, is there sort of a chance for a last comment or a thought about the whole notion of it? Um, and or um, I, I have lots of thoughts about penitential stuff, but I, I'm not the keynoter and that's, so that would be another webinar to talk about um, um, aspects of penitence in our liturgy, but that's, I, I find it quite liberating to talk about, um, to not have that as a theme in Advent. Um, but that's maybe my own persuasion. Uh, anyone else got a comment? Phil, let me clarify what I meant by that was the kind of emphasis on individual penitence that's associated with Lent. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's, this is something different, which is why I referred to my latest paper, <laughs> which deals with it in a different way. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, just a lot of individuality that gets distorted in things. Um, and that's where I guess I was the corporate nature, mm -hmm. uh, the societal nature, the structural nature of of um, being corrected by the fullness of grace of God. Seen, in, in our world, it's, everything seems so out of control and out, just messed up in our political life and in the climate and so on. The, the forces are so larger that maybe Advent with its larger focus beyond the personal privatized uh, me and Jesus is also salutary. So having more time in that context, I think is a, is a help. That's directly what I address and it's in the social okay. systemic context. Excellent. Anyone else um, before we close? Uh, just just an observation. I mean, this isn't brilliant or anything. Uh, and, and I shared it in the in our small group a little bit. But uh, as this conversation continues, I'm I, I continue to thread, uh, you know, be like beads on a string, make those connections between how an expanded advent could really help us in our ministries in overall with where we are now in the pandemic, like where we have come through and where we've been and i just I, I i don't have all my thoughts put together but to to slow it down and to really make room for the experience of advent for you know god coming in 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 new and unexpected ways and that hope and that light uh i mean we're all so exhausted and maybe with a longer advent it will help our people to not bear such a burden of I got to rush, rush, rush and get all the stuff done and wonder if I can even celebrate Christmas if I don't get sick. So there, there's just so there's so many um, um, aspects of, of this that can really uh, enable ministry on, on every level. So I, I appreciate this. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Amen, sister. Preach it. <laughs> She's one of ours, Bill. <laughs> can i be one of yours i want to move um, give me a call yes okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll pray us out i, I started started this thing um i'm gonna um there's some very good ones but i'll go with this one actually the uh, in our world we have labor labor day and that call for Labor Day was fabulous. If you get, um, but I, I'm going to do the one for peace because this works pretty well on 207. Let us pray, Almighty God, kindle, we pray in every heart, the true love of peace and guide us with your wisdom, those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility, your dominion may increase till the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 I think I have your emails because of the nature of this Zoom thing. And I will try to get the, the, the PowerPoint and the list of those slides out to everyone who is with us today. Um, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank Blessings. You. Take care. I can leave the meeting.